Welcome to Three, a part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm Gil Gross with Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. We have so much to get to as Novak Djokovic has advanced once again to the Wimbledon semifinals. His, uh, his latest victory in four sets over Andre Rublev. He will face Yannick Sinner in the next round, a rematch of, of what was a great five-setter last year. We will get to talking about the Sinner match at the end of this one. Uh, but we also need to uh, go back to his round of 16 match against Hubert Hurkacz because we have not yet discussed that. And that was a very interesting one in its own way for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first being that it took place over two days. Uh, but also, it was close. It was very close. The first two sets were tie breaks. Uh, Hurkacz managed to win the third set and Novak took the fourth Amy, uh, how much trouble do you feel like Novak was actually in against Hercotch? And and why do you think Hubie was able to get Djokovic in, in the positions that he did? In my opinion, that has been the closest contest in a while. Even more so than today's contest against Rublev. I think Hercotch was really on to something with the amount of times he was coming into the net. He had a lead in the first set tie break. He won a set, the serving, incredible. He's got a few dimensions to his game. He just doesn't have as many as Novak has. And and Novak is just superior in all these aspects, including the mental. It also struck me that the... uh... The forehand just betrays Hercotch in these moments. It's so flat. And then it's almost like he has to kind of like manage it. You know, it's like having a a car with a wobbly wheel or something. And you just don't know where it's going to go. And then he's got a, doesn't know how much to go for and calibrate. It's not late. He's letting himself able to play as freely as desired. And still, still look at all those questions he posed. Didn't, uh, what we say, Amy, we said he had to come up to net 15 to 20 times a set. In the yes. First he, in the first set, he came up 14. Yes. And there was one, he had a set point on his serve and he did, did not come to net. We should have, I wish I had had a sign in the, in the crowd, 15, 15. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> how, yeah. how did, how did he do after that? Do we, with the net rushing? I could look it up real quick. Okay. You, okay. you look it up while, okay. while I make my point. Okay. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit less kind to, to Hubie in a way. Uh, because I thought it was a stunning, stunning display of serving. I don't know that I don't know that a human can serve much better than that. It was, uh, you know, high 70s as far as percentage goes. The ace counts were unbelievably high, particularly uh, under the roof on what was it Sunday night? Um, you know, 14 aces in the second set. I think he made like 30 first serves. And 14 of them were aces in, in the second set. And in the third set, that that continued, the set that he won. Uh, but I just felt like he lost those tie breaks because he could not execute well enough outside of his serve. And as we've discussed, you know, we, we talked about it with the Jordan Thompson match, which uh, was Djokovic's second round match at Wimbledon. If you are relying on a pattern or a shot that is dependent on serving, then you can't break. And Hubie, despite, yes, I mean, I get, I get that he pushed Novak and I get that he almost won two tie breaks, but he, uh, he only got one opportunity throughout the four sets to sniff a break of serve. He did break once, that wasn't good enough. Did you find a number, Amy? You're smiling. Yeah, <laughs> this That's is hilarious. <laughs> so um, just to remind our, our listeners and viewers, Joel thought that if Hercotch could come to net an average of 15 times per set, 15 to 20 times per set, that would be what he needed to do. That would be successful for him. It could be a big key to at least being competitive against Djokovic. Well, he came to net for the match 59 times, divided by four, that's (laughs) (laughs) 14.75. See? See? Newbie. Yeah, his, his coach is a friend of mine. I know Craig Boyne. I got to say, hey, buddy, we gave you, we gave you, we sent you a truck. We sent you a helicopter. Come on, man. Get the message. 
14 now points, he, five there, but for he, the great, one more volley. Yeah. He did um, have a success rate of 73% at the net. So you know what? We're laughing, but he, he was doing something there that was very successful. Maybe he just should have just done it a little bit more. So what was it, Amy? 44, 59, something like that? Yeah, whatever, 59 divided by four numerator denominator no That's okay. we're, we're on a show um <laughs> so what's interesting about that also and i've been thinking about a lot of these numbers lately yeah 73 percent. but you also i think to me coming up to net you get i call it a tax to a tax credit even if you lose the points you gain something you gain the application of pressure and the forcing the opponent to hit a shot so it's not it's not an entire loss of a point it's almost like you should be able to deduct Okay, so he lost, let's say, 15 of those points technically lost. But it's, you know, it does, it's not quite as much. And it's, in, it's, it's interesting how that turned out to be the, the number. And yet, yet another set of a tiebreaker, of tiebreakers where Novak, as in the Australian Open final versus Tsitsipas, yeah, it was competitive, but then it wasn't. Like, it's just, you know, Pete Sampras had this going at four all, five all. Rod Laver, Pete Sampras, they're very good at winning sets from the four all, five all point. Novak, oh, I'm, I'll wait till six off. I'll wait till I'm down three set points. Not that he's waiting, but it's just, uh, it's just remarkable. He was a little tight, I would say, in in the second set tie break, uh, and in the first set tie break, Hubie, honestly, he served great. He hit, you know, there was a double fault by Novak. There was, uh, f- and four unreturned serves by Hubie, three aces, and that's basically how he got to six. Now that's five. There was one other, but that's basically how he got to six. Uh, but then, you know, when Novak put the ball in play, which he made sure to do at six, five, which was the set point on her serve, Djokovic backed up and he blocked the return. And then he got the miss. It was like, all right, you know, just got to get it in play. Her declining to serve and volley on that point. Yeah. He, he put him into the 15.2 exactly. range. Exactly. You, you should serve and volley there. There's no doubt about it. Well, it's just, it's there, there are numerous, sorry. I, I, I have, a whole little database in my head of numerous matches throughout tennis history where the the person with the volley guy kind of just just backed off a little bit and and that can that can make a difference. You got to have that faith in your in your deal. Not that he's Patrick Rafter, her coach, but ugh, man, tough, tough. What about the idea that it's impossible to serve that well in a best of five match? Like you're not going to just absolutely you're not going to serve 78% for three sets in all likelihood. Like you are going, that is going to dip. And in the fourth set, that is when the Hercotch serve just fell back down to earth and Djokovic could win without a tie break. Such right. a good point, especially when you are mixing in some serve and volley, because we in the peanut gallery, we always say, well, why don't you just serve and volley? It's so easy. You know, look at the percentages, but then go out there and try to do it. Fans, listeners in a match, it is exhausting. It's taxing running in and then going back, running in and then going back. You have to be conditioned for it and it can erode over time. The efficacy of your serve, I would imagine, especially in a best of five match. Well, this comes back to practice. I mean, it's, you know, I'll, I know it's a different era. I know it's a different service. Roy Emerson, 20 years, played Wimbledon. Never once stayed back on his first or second serve. There's no going. It's rarely going back. It's just mostly hitting the first volley and the second volley. I, it's a different game today. I'm not saying Hercotch could have played play that way. Yeah, this gets to the practice thing. Emerson, by the way, and again, this was a different era. He would practice for Wimbledon by going on the wood boards where the courts were even faster and playing six sets. Play six to get ready for five. Now, I'm not saying Hercotch should do that. But there are what what we're seeing so far, and this will this will have implications when we talk about Rublev. We're seeing kind of the the skills development package of how people go about building a playing style and how they attempt to deploy it against Novak. And you know these guys are impressive. I mean, I think Hercotch is a tremendous player. As we recall, he was the Roger Federer's last match at Wimbledon. Mm-hmm. Yep, he won six zero in the final set. So he can he's. He's really, really good. But Novak, though, you're so right, Amy. You know, maybe the, the legs get a little tired, the fatigue mm-hmm. of having – the fatigue also of being down. I think the legs are less tired when you're winning. I think. I, I, I also – but I also just think it's uh, – there doesn't need to be a reason other than mean regression. 
Like, yeah, if, if your if your first serve percentage over the course of a, a, a extremely large sample size is, let's say, 73 percent. And for three sets, you you're having a great day and you're at an average of 78 percent, which is kind of where her was living. It's going to drop. Yeah, Eubanks, Chris Eubanks said something about that on ESPN yesterday when he was interviewed. And he was talking about as a server, there are certain games where ace, unreturned serve, ace, maybe, you know, a serve and then a forehand. And you're just kind of cruising with minimal effort. And then all of a sudden, you hit a game where you're just not making first serves or, um, the person is is catching up to your speed and, and the game becomes a grind. And then suddenly your serve has dipped and, and you've got to either figure out a way to get out of that game or find the serve again. And when it comes to, and then of course, you've got a guy who's one of the three best returners in tennis history in Novak, who is very good, adjust the position, draw a little bead on it. We've been out here. We've been out here. I've now seen 120 of your first serves. I can I can read your toss more, the atmosphere. And this is, I think, I compare Novak as returner to Jimmy Connors that way and sort of the ability to spit balls back, get them in play, get the points started. It's not quite the Agassi home run hitter return. He could do that sometimes too. It's more, you know, fielding it and flinging it back and getting the point going. And now, whoa, here comes the return. Yeah, three all in the fourth set. Djokovic made four phenomenal returns off of Hercotch first serves. Like j just excellent, e even better than the, I talked about the one on six, at six, five in the first on the set point for her coach that he just kind of blocked it in. And it was like, I hope you miss Hubie. And he did. Uh, these returns were at another level. The, these were great neutralizing returns. So he definitely dialed it in at, at that point. I noticed also in the match, a, a pattern I've seen a lot more in tennis these days where a guy hits short to someone's forehand. The guy lines up the forehand approach shot. It takes a certain confidence to crack a forehand approach shot inside in from there. So the the opponent, the receiver knows he's going to go inside out. It's like I saw Novak. He knows who he's going to go inside out with a right-handed forehand approach. Moves to his left backhand and then just drills it down the line. I mean, you see that happen. You see this thing. So there's this whole these whole ways of how you go about attacking and counterattacking. It made me think. Wow, what if he had should he have hit the forehand return? Um, is he the forehand approach through the middle of the court? You know what I mean? Where, where do you aim these things? Or it's it's very it, it gets a little complicated when you start to try to run the um the highly attacking game. Amy said that that her coach gave Novak a, a better a better scare, I'll say, than Rublev. So. Yeah. Joel, do you agree? I think through and through, I think in the score line. It may not seem that way because Novak lost the first set. So that's like, I, I've talked to people about it. Would you rather win a match 7-5, seven, 7-5 five, seven, five, or win it 4-6, 3-3? Six, three three? In most cases, I'd rather win the first set. But I think with Rublev, once he kind of got himself into it by that second set, he was in pretty much more comfortable. I mean, there's a, a, a constant sense of danger with Hercotch. What do you think, Gil? I think Rublev... I, again, I, I actually go the other way. I, I think Rublev was more competitive on return than Hercotch, and therefore I actually think Rublev was more dangerous for Novak because I, I look at Djokovic's performance against Hercotch as a pretty dominant serving performance. So you thought I, Novak was in less danger, let's say, as, as we got into the second and third sets that against Hercotch than he was against Rublev? Uh, yes. So my explanation would be this. If you, if you serve great, yes, you're very good at getting it to a tie break, but I thought that Rublev was more threatening, um, a little bit more threatening. I don't think Novak was close to losing either match, uh, just because he posed problems in both games, serve game and return game. Yeah. I don't think he was close to losing either match. Let's talk I, about I, this was my way of trying to get us to the Rublev match, though. Okay. Yeah, I, I think um, it was more of a baseline game. There were longer rallies. Novak seemed content to play that way because he's beaten Rublev that way many times before. With Hercotch, the rallies were shorter. 
So it, it may seem that um, because the rallies were slightly longer, that the Rublev match was more competitive. I just think by virtue of the tiebreakers and the scoreline that it, yeah. the Hercotch match to me felt closer. They get at different ways of how you view the game. I'm hearing your, I'm hearing my friend Gil, the, the grinding baseliner, see Rublev as this kind of like, you know, he, he brings that to play and there are a lot of, yeah, competitive rallies in a way where because Hercotch, he's, he's holding, he's holding. It's pretty easy. What are we going to get to this stage? That's a, that's a great, kind of almost unanswerable question. I mean, they each had their moments. You see in each way, what a great, again, what a great problem solver. He can solve the the attacking guy who's serving well, and then he can serve, he can he can come back. Because he did have to, remember, he wasn't he wasn't ahead of that match for a very long time. So that's, if, you know, Rublev won the first set. So that creates when you, when a guy loses the first set in a best of five match, he knows, I'm not going to be able to lead this match for quite some time. And that's some hill climbing. Do either of you guys have a, an opinion on what flipped the Rublev match for Djokovic? Like, what was the difference between the first set and and the latter three? I'll tell you what I think the deal with Rublev is. I think Rublev puts his cumulative pressure. I think he puts cumulative pressure on himself because he, he reminds me of Halep that way. He has, he has to hit two or three tremendous ground strokes to point because he's so uncomfortable playing in the front part of the court. If someone like John McEnroe or Martina Hingis saw Rublev, he'd say, they'd each say, why do you make it so hard on yourself? Why don't you, you've opened up the court, walk three steps in and hit a drop volley. But that Rublev doesn't have that thing. So he, so he, there's the sense that Rublev has to hit two or three good shots to win some points again and again. So he's almost like, yeah. he's almost like, so, you know, grinding his own tires in submission. So he's, he's rearing himself down. And I think Novak's, philosophy isn't just rope a dope it's kind of go nuts go nuts you, you want you, you really you're gonna hit you're gonna hit two or three winners a match against me i no, i don't think so so i think i think the flip starts to come i mean so the question becomes where is the return again maybe it's the return to the mean in a different way the ground stroke version rublev the ground stroke way her catch the other way i mean rublev you know rublev that guy when he's starting well and playing well and you watch him take a first set you think this guy this guy's unbelievable this guy makes Agassi look like something out of the past. And, and then, and then, and then, and then what happens, he gets hard on himself. So he creates a little bit of the undertow of negativity. He, he's almost like, he's almost like consuming himself in the course of the match. Gil, to answer your question, what do I think was the difference? One word, I think it's margin. I think Andre played with, very little margin through much of the match. He was going for lines as naturally he would think he would have to against Novak. And he missed many shots of some break chances by, you know, this much challenged a few because certainly that that must have been in must have clipped the line, but it was this much. Um, and Novak conversely played with more margin and when he would hit a winner, often it would be six inches inside the baseline, not not on the line. So I think that was the difference. And in the longer rallies, Novak knew that he could hang with Rublev. And even if he didn't, he'd get him in the shorter rallies. Yeah, that's a great assessment. So in a way, we had two guys who each were kind of like redlining themselves with their own game because they knew... A, they need to do that against Novak, but B, it's also kind of built into a little bit of what their what their dynamic, what their most dynamic tennis is. And that may be the challenge of being someone who's a, a great player, and yet in Rublev's case is 0-8 now in Grand Slam quarterfinals. But he's unbelievable player, but he just so it's it's kind of a a, a thing he's got I don't know how you think about it. Once you once you've attained so much equity, accumulated so much equity. Or playing a certain way that wins you lots of titles and lots of money and top 10 mainstay, the alteration part is tough. A couple of the shifts for me, uh, first serve percentage was a shift. Rublev only won that category in the first set. Uh, Novak had the last three. Uh, I thought that Djokovic, he was trying to play through Rublev's forehand. And in the first set, a couple of times he got hurt trying to do that. 
just to set up the point. Like, let's go to the forehand to work the point and open up the space. And then there were a couple of times where, you know, he, he's just getting hurt really quickly as he goes to the strength of Rublev. Uh, then I thought he started just playing through the backhand. Like, let's get it there a little bit quicker uh, so that mm-hmm. we, can, we can go from there. Um, I, I also really admired what Novak did in the 5-4 game in the third set, serve and volley on the first break point. That was a point for five all. And suddenly we're, we, we would have had a set of piece and five all in the third. Uh, then he went to a drop shot on one of the other break points. You're seeing that variety. Uh, there was a, a good example of him playing to the backhand on the third break point where he, he had a forehand under pressure and he went down the line instead of cross court avoid Rublev's forehand. I think he did that stuff better. Um, but I also, I agree with the margin point for sure. And I agree with the, the mental toll. I mean, just how difficult it is for Rublev to execute what he did in the first set with just the killer offensive ground strokes hitting through the, the D of Djokovic and the movement of Djokovic, which has looked great for this entire tournament. Joel, um, Rublev uh, net approaches 15 for the entire match. <laughs> eight, eight of, I saw eight of 15. Uh, Djokovic, yeah. 21 of 27. And yeah. and again, and and those, so I, but I, okay, so here, here's a thought of it. 21 and six, but I'm going to make it more like 21 and three. You see what I mean? It's kind of like, I'm going to give Novak, those six he lost, he's doing things. He's a, he's, mm-hmm. he's making this happen. And then I saw what, Rublev, 44% of his second serve points compared to 65 for Novak. And again, there's Wait, just a really? love is kind of uh, locked into a certain uh, certain way of playing points that's really hard to scale over five sets. And Novak, yeah. Novak you know, it's funny. Even the thing I, I like that he used variety. I was texting someone today. I said, why do we call it that a player adds variety to their game? Like as if they're like a software app. Why isn't it start by playing tennis? Why aren't those things in the operating system initially? As the whole game, it's why don't they like just play tennis? It's instead of variety, you know, nuance. It's called tennis. It's like you know, you know, you know. It's a football team doesn't say, "Oh, we we've added variety by now." Right, we're running a screen pass. No, we have a screen pass from the start. And I think, but Novak, it's it's very impressive how he um how he broadens and deploys his his uh, arsenal. Well, I think you uh, you build. There's a philosophy that first you build basics and fundamentals. And those basics and fundamentals for, for you, Joel, is probably a little bit different as a definition compared to the basics and fundamentals for some other coaches who feel, let's start here, forehand, backhand, and, yeah. and we'll figure out the other stuff later. Well, but see, well, this is a philosophical, why isn't a drop shot a basic? I well, mean, because, is- because it's a lower, it's a low, it's a smaller slice of the pie. You're not, it's not. It, it might get come into play on, you know, maybe a few points every set, but your forehand and your backhand are going to come into play and your serve is going to come into play. I know, but you see, yeah, right. Of course. And there are other people who neglect, okay. The, who neglect the serve. I mean, like, for example, on the other hand, where they have the serve they have and they don't do that much with it. Whereas you look at Novak and all the things he's done to make his serve better. I don't know. There's an interesting you didn't question that it makes it yet is. another thing, another way I want to um, read the riot act at a coach's convention. <laughs> yeah. Coaches about how they go about instructing. And you see that, like, for example, I'd love to talk to Rublev's form, formative coach. When, when were you going to get to that? When were you going to get to that stuff when he was 35 years old? <laughs> I mean, he, that's a guy that just leans into his strengths and, and has decided I'm just going to go hard um, Joel was right. 44% second serve points one for Rublev. He's got a slow second serve and against the world's greatest returner, maybe in history, that's not going to cut it. He's well, better now. It used to be slower. It was, it was my number one, like, what are we doing here with Rublev with the, <laughs> the 80 miles per hour second serves? He's, he's doing that a little bit less now. Well, it's also when a guy loses second serve points, it's not just the function of the, of the serve of, of the serve speed. And also, it's also like, you know, Rublev is a highly patterned player, and that's what's made him great to degree. But you kind of know where it's going, and he doesn't have as much space to work with as he does with his ground strokes and rallies. So Novak, like I, I think, I think Novak would say to himself, "If I miss a second serve return against this guy, that is a that is a big crime." And then, yeah. and then once the rally gets going, like what is Rublev's serve even? 
accomplishing. At least Novak, when he's sometimes, okay, even a servant volleyed on something, even a second. It's like, again, I'm, I'm throwing you looks. I'm throwing you a different look of something. So maybe it's funny. We saw Rublev more of a return guy, Hercoc more of a serve guy. Yeah, they each huffed and they puffed. All right, well, let's get to the center match. I uh, I don't think that Yannick is that dissimilar in his play style to Andre Rublev. I just think he's more athletic and more dynamic in in the way he's able to execute it. Um, he's he has a, a certain flexibility and an agility uh, with the way he moves on the grass. It comes out especially in his return of serve, where he's long and rangy. His mm-hmm. his backhand is. Uh, is more threatening than than Andre's, particularly cross court, because Rublev just uh, sorry uh, center just brings more power on his two hander. But at the end of the day, uh, the big strength for center is a relentless baseline power. So how how does Novak contend with that, Amy? So I just wrote a preview on this and I was looking because Sinner is a good returner, I think superior to Rublev. And I was looking at Novak's second serve speeds because as we know, he's messed around with that over the course of his career. And he's actually been of the guys who are left. He's actually been um, serving like 91, 92 miles per hour second serve. So that's pretty slow relatively um, in comparison to say Alcaraz Runa. So um, that would be an area to keep an eye on, a really good returner. And if so, if Novak knows this, does he increase the speed on his second serve? Does he try to do something different with it, which he is more than capable of doing? But I thought that that would be an interesting matchup within the matchup. I like that. I think he also needs to, with Sinner, he needs to do a lot of kind of probing, you know, to see where the power is more coming from, read the what the return is this time, what is that time? Because I agree with that assessment of Sinner as kind of a, a more um a higher octane rublev more power more movements even a little bit more variety he's been working on coming to net a bit more i'd be curious to see if if he does that how he does that versus novak i hope he comes to net more than 15 times mm-hmm. uh well yeah rublev 15 a match compared to we wanted her couch 15 a set but uh i just uh yeah it'll be interesting to see how novak kind of takes his measure and sees w- what side is returning better on or or how he's serving, that's fascinating. Remember, Sinner led him two sets to love last year in the quarters. Mm-hmm. Yep, and then- It's it's almost like apples to apples. We'll see, you know, if, if Novak has been fairly consistent in his level of greatness, especially in the slams, um, we'll see how much Sinner has actually grown, or has he maybe- needed to take a step back or taken a step back um, as he continues to try to take steps forward. Well, he's definitely worked on stuff. I think he's serving bigger now, um, much bigger actually than, than he was last Mm -hmm. year. Uh, And the, the touch and the feel stuff, it's, it's funny because he's trying very hard, which is definitely going to pay off, but I don't know if it's going to pay off now I think it may pay off like next year or the year after like a lot of the drop shots that he's trying to incorporate and you know the fact that he is willing to come forward but his volleys just aren't that good it, i think it costs him points in the present but it's going to win him points in the future that's a great assessment i think that's fantastic you're right here he is he's playing kind of like the 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 master you know he's playing the the, the dean of the faculty and it will come in handy as he continues to buy with his peers with his runas and his alcaraz as that class continues to to grow through their tennis life however however now yeah that's a big that's a different kettle of fish versus Novak and so so then he's got he's got the conundrum of okay do I just st- see Rublev Rublev doesn't even invest in that that's my that's a little bit of my teary-eyed thought for Rublev is he doesn't even invest in that stuff because he's come further and he's a little older or whatever or just who he is whereas Sinner working with Darren Cahill getting certain kind of input. So he's he's 
putting these pieces together. And though at the same time, the last two was five sets. If he loses this one in four sets, Sinner shouldn't necessarily think, well, I'm worse. He has to look at the actual tennis and how the point, because last year's, as I recall, once Novak got ahead, even in the third set, it looked like, all right, this guy, it, it reminds me of that 21 Roland Garros final versus Tsitsipas. Once no, that's the great thing about Novak. He's down two sets to love. He's up in the third. It looks like he's going to win the third. Yeah, he's probably going to win the match now. That's what I was saying at the time. I'm, I And for both of those matches, I'm glad you brought the Tsitsipas match up. Yes, he was two sets to love down. He, he But Sinner didn't come close to winning. Like, in order for me to be like, you almost won, you have to get close to winning the third set of a, of a best of five. Otherwise, you didn't almost win. You just won two sets. And it, basically, in the last three sets of that match, every set was early Djokovic break, protect the lead. I three. believe he's done it seven times in his career. Novak, lose the first two sets in a grand slam and then come back and win the match. It's amazing. Yeah. Oh, well, that's a lot of that's what some of those great champions have done. I mean, the ones they've done, uh, you know, seven, eight, quite a, quite a bunch. And and you're right. It's I remember once watching a match, uh, the players down five zero in the first set, won a game, and my friend and I said, "It's over. It's now over." <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like it's over. It became one of those like seven five six two, whatever kind of things. Since I just looked looked up uh, this stat. Since Djokovic lost the first set, uh, since the center match last year, Novak has won every match at a major where he's lost the first set. He's that's one, two, three, four, that's five. So he's on a five match winning streak when losing the first set. Wait a second, hasn't let's see since Wimbledon last year, hasn't Novak when was the last time Novak lost a match at a slam? Um, 22 Roland Garros. Yes. To Rafa? Yeah. Yeah, and, and he oh. lost the first set in that one. So I guess I guess that stat isn't well, it, it still means something. It means that you win the first set and there are some good players in here. It means nothing. It means very what little. I call it, what I call a contestable nugget. It's a nugget. You win the first two sets. It means very little. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh lost sets one and two in his career. Uh he's six and twenty two. That's his wow. record when he loses the first two sets. Wow. Amazing. So six times he's come from two sets to love down. I thought I read seven. I, I could be wrong. Or where I got that could be wrong as sure. well. Sure. I, I just pulled I up Tennis it, Abstract. Was it, well, it's on it's on the daily ITF things that they send. And also the um there might have been it might have been six of the slams and maybe there's a Davis Cup in there. Yeah, right true enough. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Definitely. We'll also see how uh, Sinner manages his nerves in his first major semifinal. He's the underdog. That might help. Um, uh, not to mention the fact that his draw has been so, so, so kind that it's it's hard to know like how well exactly is Sinner playing. He looks very good to me, uh, but he hasn't played anyone uh, close to to Novak's level and route to the tournament, which is a little bit uh, atypical at the semifinal stage. We will see third ever meeting between Djokovic and Sinner in the Wimbledon semifinal, and we will talk to you afterwards. That'll do it for this episode of Three. Remember, we're available on all podcast platforms. We appreciate it if you leave a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify. And if you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, and subscribe. We will see you next time on the next episode of Three.